Good morning. This is New York City Board of Standards and Appeals Public Review Session for September 11th, 2017. We'll begin with the special order calendar, continued hearing items. Item number 1, 41850BC, 7369, 217th Street, 7336 Springfield Boulevard, 219 274th Avenue, and 7310, 220th Street, Queens. Okay, um, they requested an adjournment. Um, However, they said that they're going to be submitting a closing memo and then withdraw the application. Um, simultaneously, though, we heard both at the hearing and also at, um, we have a letter from a member of the public that um, uh, complaining about non-compliant conditions on the site. And so after the uh, application is withdrawn, we will um, require a compliance hearing on this. We had already talked to them about cleaning up the site. So they should have done that already or gotten started at the very least and show us progress photos um, installing the fencing that's required and cleaning, removing the debris from the forest or the planted area. Okay. Any other comments on that? Item number 2, 24055BZ, 20722 Northern Boulevard, Queens. Um, okay. um, this application has been in hearings for exactly one year. At the last hearing in January, um, um, and there were three adjournments since then in March, May, and June, we asked that the 45th Road gate be closed to vehicles and that the 45th Road frontage be planted with dense shrubs. We also asked for an easement agreement to allow passage for the cars of the cars for this use over the parking lots of the adjacent owners. Um, the submission for today's hearing, which is nine months after the last hearing, shows only the 45th Road vehicle gate closed and no allowance for planting. And this is just a plan, so that doesn't take very long to do, right? Um, no agreement with the adjacent property um, was provided either. And a note on the plan seems to indicate that the applicant will wait for DOB to require it, that, which I, I actually don't understand because that's what we're requiring. Um, and uh, I want to say that this, is, this case has been so slowly prosecuted um, with little dribs and drabs of agreement um, that I, I personally would like to say that if we don't receive the required materials, including well, other things that were asked, light spread diagram, revised plan showing the landscaping and proof of installation of the new fencing um, and planting by the next hearing that we should either just dismiss the application for failure to prosecute or vote to deny it. Um, and just to be clear about the planting so we don't have any more back and forths, um, that should be uh, in ground four foot wide planting beds with six foot high um, uh, perennial planting at six feet on center. Um, perennial might be um, a, a U known as Taxus media brownie, but there are other options. Um, I want to add that if we dismiss the case, it will render the auto sales use illegal and the current activity on the site non-compliant with the existing variance, which is for automotive service, um, and, and that variance expires at the end of 2018. Any other, other comments on this? Didn't the applicant say that from now on their plan is to have access to Northern Boulevard? Yeah. Yes, they said it and they showed on the drawing right. that they would show the fence. They, the, the drawing shows just a person fence going to 45th Road, but how are they getting access from Northern <coughs> Boulevard because they, that means them driving through. But those abutting properties are owned by them. But they're not necessarily that they're we don't That's know the ownership you need to have some I sort of an agreement oh no i thought they said from now on they were only going to go in right. and out on northern boulevard which would make not necessary the need for an easement agreement unless at some point they do want to broach the subject with dob but as for us they i thought they put they said that from now on vehicle access will only be through northern boulevard but how do they get through it from northern boulevard they have to go through their own showroom right that's yeah they have a overhead door but their showroom has cars in the way 
But right, but I, I thought that they were just those those cars are going to be cars that are demo cars and that it was going to be through the mm -hmm. overhead door. That's what I thought. No? I don't understand. I thought there were two changes. Yeah, I thought tomorrow. there were two chains of uh, possibilities. One was accessing through Northern Boulevard from their site, and the other one was through the abutting yeah. properties that they own. To, uh, again, to Northern Boulevard. The bottom line was the access would be from uh, um, would be only from Northern Boulevard and not from 45th. And, right. And the fact that they are proposing to close the 45th Road. Uh, entrance and only re leaving a pedestrian entrance led me to believe that they were going to only use the Northern Boulevard entrance. No, I'm, I'm assuming only using the Northern Boulevard entrance, but you can't pass over someone else's property if that, what I understand is, it's another dealership. You don't have the rights to pass over it without being granted license to pass over it. But, I thought that that right, but, it, but it's owned by them. No, but that they're not even talking about that anymore. They're saying that they're going to be accessing the site through their existing legal curb cut on Northern Boulevard. Right. On their own, through their own showroom. Right. Yeah. Please be advised that the yes. operator currently intends to use the Northern Boulevard entrance as the means of vehicle access to the site. Then it says, however, any future use of the eastern gate, they will lead to DOB. Right. That's what I don't understand. The future use of the eastern gate left to DOB for what? For determination for as to whether or not DOB wants to allow it. But, but what they're saying is they're providing for us an operational plan that doesn't need that eastern gate. Right. But the part that I'm having trouble with is leaving to DOB to determine what? If Turn DOP off. determines that they can't use they it. can't use they can't go through their own showroom. No, no, that's no, no, not no, no, no. They're they going to determine whether they could use the adjacent, adjacent lot for access to the Volkswagen dealership three right. lots down. Why would deal? Be determine whether they can it doesn't make a difference whether DOB determines it frankly because to me what the way I look at it is they've provided an operational plan for us to look at right. that says that they don't even need that eastern gate in the rear the operational plan is saying that they're going to access Northern Boulevard from their very own tax lot that's the subject of this or zoning lot right. so therefore whether or not they choose to try and use the Eastern Gate with DOB approval or whether or not they illegally use the Eastern Gate well, three years from now without DOB approval, it's not to me a BSA issue anymore because they're provided for us an operational plan that shows they don't have to use that gate. We can't predict whether or not somebody's going to in the future do something illegal and we should no, assume they're going to no, do no, something No, 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 I'm not talking about doing something illegal. I'm talk talking about trying to understand how they're actually going to do this because if you go back to the beginning of this application, they said we can't have cars coming in through our own property because of how we use that structure. So they can't drive through the structure. They have to drive through the adjacent property. Right. But but now, as of the most recent submission, they did change that. So, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how they're going to rearrange whatever furniture and cars may be in the showroom to allow them to do that. But their cover letter states that from now on, they're going to have access through the existing and legal curb cut on Northern Boulevard. Okay, so I, I personally need a clarification because I don't understand how you go from one thing to the other without doing some change that they mention, right? So otherwise, <coughs> I, yeah. I just don't understand it. And then I don't understand DOB, where DOB comes into this. That, that's the other part I understand. It's like, what's DOB got to do with it? Except that they may not even need to, is what I'm saying. It'd be interesting to see how they propose the access through their one existing legal curb cut, whether or not maybe the automobiles will be shoved to one side that allows a drive path. It'll be interesting to see. Yeah, okay. So let's just get further mm -hmm. clarification on that. Okay. But meanwhile, we also didn't get planting beds 
a lighting spread diagram, which we requested before, um, proof of installation of the new fencing, um, et cetera. So there were other things that we asked for since way longer ago than January, and we still haven't seen them. Item number three, 94957 BZ, 2100 Williams Bridge Avenue, the Bronx. Um, the applicant um, submitted photos of the site showing planting, striping, general conditions, and trash enclosure. And with the exception of the sound attenuation blank, um, material anyway around the AC units um, which apparently is now on order all of the work requested by the board has now been done and although I wish there had been a better solution for the trash enclosure and I think um, looking at how they handled that I think the BSA should develop a standard for these trash enclosures so they don't all look so jerry built I mean this one you know they went to the fence store and they bought a few pieces of fence and I mean, I think we could actually come up with something that's more uh, <coughs> standardized. Um, so anyway, so I'm okay with voting on this um, and proposing a condition to install the AC sound attenuation. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Item number four, 70459 BC, 53 East 177 Street, the Bronx. Okay. Yeah, um, submitted photos? Yeah, yeah. So they requested an adjournment initially, um, and the statement from the applicant um, was that the work was in process. Um, but actually, we didn't require much work to be done on the site. Um, and uh, we also had requested um, plans. Um, so my response was there wasn't really any reason to adjourn and so they should give us progress photos like what have you done so far so in response um, they did in fact submit progress photos and um, it looks like actually the fencing is installed so I'm surprised that they wanted to adjourn this at all are they gonna come to the hearing yes. now? Mm -hmm. so now they're gonna come so the, the progress shows very nice fence and very nice planting yay a very nice booth for the attendant um, and everything actually looks super good. So other than whatever plan modifications needed to be done, um, they're probably good to go. But I don't, I, let's see, the, the plan modifications were very minor. It was like, um, re, you know, we wanted them to remove barbed wire and the post for the sign at the corner. Um, we, uh, wanted them to show bumper locations on the plans and about, verify that they're in there place. There was only one question, and that was the fence alignment uh, along yes. the bottom. And I know, and that needed to be represented in the plans. And I'm right. assuming that also has been executed uh, with this improvement. Uh, I couldn't verify it from the photos. No, because you can't see that right. fence, right? Yeah, the, the property line boundary, we asked them for a survey and to show that the fence is on the property line. Yeah. Um, and uh, there was a photo number 16 that needed to be coordinated with the plans. <coughs> so it'd be great if that per they could just take care of that and and then um, I think we would be done. I'm sorry, photo 16? So, so these are notes from last, last time. Night. So <laughs> it was there, um, we needed a survey because it looks like the fence was off the property line based on the drawing, the plans. Um, and photo number 16 has some element that doesn't match the plans. Okay. Um, uh, they provided photos of the booth. Um, they, should, they were supposed to provide a lighting spread diagram, including specs on the lighting used, um, to show on the plans the bumper locations and verify that they're in place, which I don't think you can see on those photos. Um, they were supposed to take care of the vines on the fencing and all that, but it looks like they put in new fencing, so it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to have removed the barbed wire, but the photographs look like it's all really dolled up in a new fence, so there's no place for barbed wire. Um, it says the open fence outside around the outside perimeter reveals the cars, so it's made opaque, which is what they did. 
So really, they, it looks like they did all the, the site work. It's just some drawings. Okay. I will let you know. Okay. Item number five, 3695 BC, 6575 Woodhaven Boulevard, Queens. They requested an adjournment, and we need a status report on the fire alarm installation. Um, trying for these adjournments not to be used as an excuse not to do the work. So what we were work looking for was the fire alarm um, and need a report tomorrow on where the fire alarm is. Okay. Item number six, 3000 BZ, 465-469 West 165th Street, and 458-464 West 166th Street, Manhattan. And likewise, this one requested an adjournment. Um, this has been going on for a really long time, since May of last year with a change in council. Um, so they need to provide photos and a status report on the improvements. Um, the we haven't gotten the requested submissions, um, and uh, so I would like to say that I don't think an adjournment is appropriate. They should attend and um, give us a um, status report and a reminder that we can dismiss this for failure to prosecute because it's been over a year and really very little has happened on this site. So um, we can do that and will if we don't see something fast. Item number seven, 18005 BZ, 1511 3rd Avenue, Manhattan. Okay. So, um, council on this submitted a letter stating that the board must have been, must have been aware of the location uh, that part of the building was located outside of the commercial <laughs> district boundary um, at the time that it granted the PCE, and in spite of that fact. Um, uh, the, in spite of the fact that the board didn't have the authority to grant a PCE special permit for that portion that sits in the residential, it, 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 um, it did it anyway, and therefore, um, therefore this board should um, continue that error. Um, I actually don't understand the reasoning, um, and I don't find anything in the resol resolution that acknowledges somehow um, the board's ability to treat an existing non-conforming floor area as eligible for a 7336 special permit when it's, that floor area is sitting in an R district. And it's not subject to the, what is it, 7211 um, extension of the district 7711. boundary. 7711 extension of the district boundary, which it isn't because the zoning lot was enlarged in 2006. Six. So that undid any possibility of keeping the, um, treating the district boundary as if um, it had moved the 25 feet. Um, um, applicants Council did absolutely nothing to help us make the connection, um, such as providing us with copies of the previously heard application materials and walking us through the analysis, or providing us with other examples of the board treating an existing building that extends more than 25 feet into a residence district um, as if it's in a C district and hence susceptible to a 7336 special permit. So I, I actually don't see where our authority is on this and if council's so convinced that we have the authority, they need to explain it to us. And you know, also this building had an extremely checkered past at the board. It was at the board for many different cases and the board pointed out, denied often applications for PC and a variance and so on um, and and really dug into the um, the sh let's say the amount of commercial floor area that was on the site so it's obviously always been a, a very troubled site um, okay. uh, I'm trying to understand this uh, project and I was trying to review the past uh, uh, resolutions and from what I understand, this building was previously a, in, entirely in a commercial zone and had commercial use. And then the site, uh, the zoning districts were revised, whereby a portion of the site became part of 
purely R8 and the portion had the commercial overlay. Right. So goes back to the argument of how extensive of the commercial use the building had prior to the rezoning that happened. And, uh, and that, that has been indicated that this was always a commercial building which had commercial use Correct. entirely. So it's a pre-existing non-complying building prior to the rezoning. Um, and then uh, when the board did evaluate... Pre-existing, pre non-conforming non and non-complying. Right. It had a period both. where it was both. Both, yes. right. Yes, it had both. And when the, bo uh, when the prior board uh, reviewed the uh, action, it did, at least the way I read the resolution, it seemed like they were aware of the fact that they were the, this was a non-compliant building with non-conformance, um, and um, the issue was with the additional encroachment that had happened in the rear, which, uh, which uh, for which the commercial use was being, uh, the, the request was to allow for commercial use in that in section of the encroachment, and the, and the uh, board in previous boards are very particular that that particular encroachment be carved out because that was an add-on post rezoning and that particular add-on should not be considered as commercial use and should remain either as a residential or a community facility use. Only the existing portion of the building that was always a non-complying and non-conforming would be allowed to retain commercial use and that's how I read the uh, resolution and um, <coughs> I I, I, I'm yeah, so, yeah. So, so, so I'm little. I, I, I'm, I, I I'm trying to. I, I just want to clarify. So there were several actions on this site. The first one was a rear yard addition was built right. here, right? And a neighbor complained. Right, right. And the rear yard addition was built, and the board um, denied the, let's say, agreed with the appellant that 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 the addition was improper. Right, right. The other part of it had to do with them trying, the next case was a PCE application, which the board denied mm -hmm. um, because there was too much commercial floor area right. on the zoning lot right. under the current, under the then zoning, under the then zoning, right? So it said, you need to convert this much floor area to community facility use, mm -hmm. and then we can't grant the PCE for the amount of commercial floor area you want because you don't have enough, right? So that was a denial. Then it was a very it got converted to a variance right. application, which was also denied because I assume they because they couldn't find an A. So the um, and then they came in as a, this this current PCE came in, acknowledging that they didn't have enough commercial floor area. So what happened was, in connection with a development that was going on on the corner of 86th Street, there was a zoning lot merger. So, so just to back up a little bit, the existing building is um, a, like a 1901 building mm -hmm. that's 125 feet from the corner, mm -hmm. right? So under the then zoning, um, the zoning district boundary line was 100 feet, and the existing building got the benefit of 77, 11. 11. The 25 foot. The 25 mm -hmm. foot rule. So right. until the merger with the rest of the, the increase on in the size of the zoning lot, it got that 25 foot rule, right? So the entire lot could have been considered commercial, mm -hmm. therefore susceptible to a, um, a special permit, a PCE special permit. In the interest of curing the deficient amount of, of commercial floor area, when the zoning lot merged, um, the, own, the, the purchasers of the development rights gave back to this building a certain amount of commercial floor area that they didn't need because they actually were building a residential project. So they gave to this building additional commercial floor area in an attempt to cure the overbuild of the commercial floor area. What nobody seems to have realized is when they merged the zoning lot, they rendered the zoning lot no longer susceptible to the 25-foot rule because that only applies when it's a pre-61 lot. Okay. 
Okay, that's the problem. And the board never mentioned that part. And I think what probably happened is the board was so involved in this deficiency of commercial floor area that had been going on for years on this site. The board heard this, heard it, things to do with the site for years and years and knew that it was deficient with respect to commercial floor area. And they didn't notice. That's all I can think the of. The zoning lot wasn't merged. So my notes I have that the resolution was granted in February 2006, but the zoning lot descriptions of merged lots weren't filed until April 2006. That's true, but the resolution for some reason acknowledges the size of the zoning lot. Okay, and it includes and, the merge. Yeah, even though it's right. So the zoning lot merger was September, and in January 2006 there was a certification of parties and interest filed. Ah that um, showed it was the smaller zoning lot, so it would have been fine. Um, but then, or actually no, because they'd already merged with the neighbor down the street, but anyway, it was still only 125. Yeah. And then in, 2000, in September, it became much bigger. So that, that's the problem. And, you know, I'm happy to find for the applicant to show us a way out of it, but I don't know what the way out of it is. But I go back to the fact that this was a previously, prior to the zoning lot merger and prior to the redistricting, this building was entirely a commercial building. It operated as a commercial use. Um, uh, but for the addition that was made in the rear, um, so I'm trying to grapple with that thing. If this was all along a commercial building with commercial use, it, except for the portion where the board denied an ex, uh, additional encroachment of commercial use. No, so um, I'm not sure that the entire, so the building was originally built as a bank, um, but then a lot of it was converted to community facility, at which point you abandoned right the commercial so there was a lot of community facility in the building they don't know how much because I without going back again the applicant hasn't given us any of that stuff so some of this is trying to figure it out from public documents um, trying trying to figure it out right but if the build even if the building had been a non-conforming commercial building mm -hmm. The PCE special permit is only available to buildings located in a commercial zone. So you could have an existing non-conforming building dead center in the middle of an art district. It's not available right. to no, receive right. a special right. permit. And that's how it went through exactly. the variance to make that justification. It, well. it tried, but it didn't succeed with the variance, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, right? Sorry. But I thought it was... So that, that's the problem. The special permit is very direct. It's only available to buildings located in certain C districts <coughs> in M's, right? Mm -hmm. So what do you do when, by operation of law, it isn't in the C district? Like, operation of law would have been the 25-foot rule, but the 25-foot rule doesn't apply here and, and didn't apply during the time it like it for instance if it had applied back in the day and now it's for an extension at least it applied mm -hmm. back in the day it when it was initially it was lawful at the time of grant right grand. so what's really unfortunate is they should have merged the zoning lot after <laughs> but then they wouldn't have cured the commercial right. floor area yeah. so somebody wasn't paying attention to all of the ducks right okay move on yeah New cases, item number eight, 52864BZ, 24002 Northern Boulevard, Queens. Okay. Um, this is a compliance hearing, um, which we're holding after an almost two year review of a proposed amendment. Um, that case was withdrawn after um, the board made statements during the hearings um, that it should be dismissed for failure to prosecute. Um, so, with respect to the compliance, oh. sorry. Um, 
this was dismissed. This was dismissed. It wasn't withdrawn. Oh, I thought we it was withdrawn. They submitted a letter to withdraw. We this, this we moved. We said issue? that it would be dismissed. And I thought they. I can double. Yeah. Okay. I thought they submitted Thank a letter you. at after. Okay. Yes. Anyway. Um. So now I'm scrolling because I have a million drawings of all the compliance. Okay. So um. So it be um. So compliance issues that were raised during the course of the hearings concerned signage, parking on the sidewalks, employee and on-site parking, an unpermitted trailer on site, the absence of required fencing and planting, lighting, alarm noise at the Hanover entrance, curb cuts and drainage nuisances, and about the exhaust filtration system that was required by the 1956 variance. Um, the community board also made the following recommendations in connection with the application. Um, one, that a motion sensor be installed on the rear garage door. Additional parking not be used for new inventory, but only for customers and employees. And that the owner address and remedy all drainage problems on the property. Um, the owner responded to our compliance request in July to the, um, to the above questions. The, um, it said, uh, let's see, <coughs> that they have installed um, a remote control device system so that their staff can open and close the rear garage door quietly, which eliminates the need to honk, um, which was of concern to neighbors. They also um, have said that they also agree to the condition that the parking not be used for new in not be used for new inventory, but only for customers and employees. Mm -hmm. And that um, they have reached out to Council Member um, Valone's office and DEP to assist in the drainage problem. Um, they also engaged new council um, very recently, so that new council had to jump on this quite quickly um, to address the compliance hearing. And council submitted copies, which I thought were extremely helpful, of DOB approved plans from 1956 um, showing um, certain signage because science signage was a big discussion. Mm -hmm. um, the drawings um, weren't clear enough to read about whether those are also BSA approved drawings, mm -hmm. but the BSA resolution refers to drawings dated May 23rd, 55 and February 10th, 56. And these are from March 26, 56, which is still impressive that they found DOB drawings from 1956. Um, However, the 56 and 57 BSA resolutions were very specific about the signage, stating that they had to comply with the regulations applicable to a local retail district. Um, no roof signs and no temporary signs. And um, the later resolutions, including the 64 resolution, where um, that combined all of the tax lots into one case, um, made no mention of sign waivers um, requiring compliance with all other rules. Um, the approved 65 and 67 elevations show certain signs in place but without dimensions. Um, so, so far I, I don't see anything um, with respect to signage that indicates a waiver on signs. So that indicates to me that whatever the signs are they have to comply with the C1 regulations. And, that seems clear. Um, with respect to the compliance checklist, um, a, site in, um, a site inspection by the um, applicant's new council really needs to be done, um, or by the architect, uh, because the answers can't be upon information and belief. Um, you don't need to believe somebody else's information if you go there yourself and you see the sign is installed or the light is installed, that kind of thing. Um, the owner's rep also appears to be making an argument that the 64 variance eliminated the conditions that were associated with the pre-64 variances because they aren't specifically mentioned mm. in the 64 resolution. Um, I don't think that actually makes sense since the 64 resolution also doesn't restate in detail the scope of the previous variances, which were continued, right? So according to that, the 64 variance would have been limited to the specific relief granted in 1964 rather than amending the prior grants. Um, 
And I have to say that the safeguards put in place under the pre-64 variances were determined to be necessary to protect neighbors and the public from the use. So they have to still apply. Um, with respect to the pooling in front of the curb cut on 234th Street, um, Council Member Vallone has reached out to DEP to install a catch basin, but um, I noticed that the roadbed is also in really bad condition, and much of that seems to be caused by the retaining wall at the dead end point. So it's like a combination. It's actually it's DEP, it's DOT because the roadbed's in really bad shape, and it's Department of Parks because that adjacent property is a city park. So um, I think if we can reach out on this side to DEP, DOT, and Parks by sending a note um, and ask them to take a look at it, maybe with all three agencies requested, somebody will take care of the problem. Um, with respect to the trailer, the board has been discussing removal of the trailer since 2015. Um, they have to provide proof that an application has been made for all two modifications to the existing building to provide the interior office space that it will be relocated from that trailer. But I know that there um, have been no filings at this since 2012. Um, and there is actually an open all two application for interior work. So I don't see why you actually even have to file a separate permit. You just do the work and you make an amendment. Um, according to whatever the work is. So I don't see what the delay is and they need to do it right now. Um, with respect to the sidewalk parking, we had discussed this at length at prior hearings and concluded that bollards and chains would prevent sidewalk parking. Um, I thought they were actually installed, but they haven't been installed. Um, and we even said, you, you know, the bollards can drop down for the car to come in and out, but you need the bollards so that there isn't the temptation. Um, the existing plans submitted also don't show any parking at the front of the site along Northern Boulevard, which is so strange because there's so much parking along there. Um, with respect to the landscaping, the 64 plans include a site section um, that we had requested during the recent hearings um, um, that shows the relationship of the residential properties to the subject site and how planting, retaining walls, parapet walls, and the site, the slope of the site um, would screen the use from the neighboring properties. So it's actually really helpful to see how steep it is and how the residential is affected by this use. Um, the submission on landscaping, fencing, and lighting um, needs to include the proposed plans. Um, um, and, and what else? That, I think that was it. Anybody else? Um, it just seems to me like they're substituting the landscaping with a fence, with like a, a fence that's kind of like an opaque, woven, fake landscaping fence. And I don't know if that's what we contemplated. No. I thought we contemplated actual live yes, screening. Live. It seems like in the latest submission in September 4th, there was an attempt to plant some things in the back by the residential, but it's kind of hard to tell if it's it, it definitely is too sparse to count as what we would right. think of as a dense planting strip and i agree with you there's there was no actually no parking allowed in the front until the 1966 bsa plans and then it was only on the western side of the showroom yep. and not the eastern mm -hmm. side but now all those photos show that there's dense parking in both sides around the showroom and it's not clear that they all fit in before the sidewalk so I agree some kind of bollard and chain system is definitely necessary. Okay. Good. <coughs> Item number 9, 10706BZ, 140 East 23rd Street, Manhattan. Okay, so this is a new hearing. Um, we have proof of service of the initial application and proof of notice <coughs> of hearing to officials. Community Board 8 recommended approval. Fire Department signed off. However, um, there is a New York Post article from March 28, 2017, with a racy photograph next to it, um, 
describing a lawsuit that was lodged against this, this PCE for noise and vibration disturbances to neighbors. Um, uh, on the other hand, the statement of fact states there's been no complaints relating to noise against mm -hmm. the site, so it's something's amiss. Um, so since this is an extension of term, neighbors were not notified, that's pursuant to BSA rules. Um, so neighbors weren't notified of the hearing, but in this case, given the post article, they really need to be. Um, and so notice needs to be posted in the building lobby um, and so that we can have another hearing to see whether or not there's issues still with neighbors. Um, and I, the, the statement of facts was a little unclear about the hours being requested. There's a typo, so you can't really tell um, what they want to do on Friday. Mm -hmm. um, and so if they could just clarify that. Any other no. comment? Um, did they give us massage licenses? Because there's quite oh. a number of massage no, I didn't see any. No. Item number 10, 223 07BZ, 1257, 12 West 57th Street, Manhattan. Okay, this one they requested postponement of the hearing until December, um, pending clarification of rights under the lease. Um, it's possible the lease won't be renewed, apparently. Yeah. Appeals calendar decision items. Item number 11, 2016, 4256A, 147 Stetchers Street, Staten Island. This is a, a little complicated because we're trying to work with the borough president's office and get everything kind of in line. Um, plans were revised to show the width and length of Stetcher, um, extending to the full width of the property um, and the full depth of Stetcher, which was something the borough president had requested. Um, they provided a document um, that conveys the property and um, shows for the right of access to Stetcher Street. Um, in June, also, which is something else we asked for, in June the architect submitted a letter describing how drainage will be addressed at the site along with approved the EP water sewer plans. And the only thing that may be missing, but I just want the applicant to respond to this, is what was requested at the last hearing via the borough president's office, which was a maintenance declaration for the street bed property along with a declaration of public use. So the declaration of public use may not actually be necessary because there's this right of way. Um, but on the other hand, um, the borough president's really just trying to clean these, these locations up. And this would just be a restrictive declaration that's a, a recorded against the property. It's not that big of a deal. It just says, I'm the owner of this property and I declare that I will maintain the roadbed in front of my property and keep it clear of snow and so on. And if the if eventually there is corporation council opinion that it's include that this section of uh, Stetcher is included, then that person is kind of absolved of the responsibility because the city snow so. clearer mm -hmm. will keep clearing, right? And the sanitation department will keep sanitizing, <laughs> et cetera, like that. So I, I think that that thing, that maintenance declaration really should be prepared. We have a standard form that we use and um, it would just be a lot easier and it would make Borough President, um, let's say, more comfortable with this application. Okay. Continued hearing items, item number 12, 255-15A, 106 Ebbett Street, Staten Island. Okay, um, the site plan was revised to show the relocation of the concrete wall and fence within the property line on Manila Place frontage, which <laughs> is kind of right, it's supposed to be on your property. Um, the survey was revised to show the distance from the property line to the street wall at the first floor, um, that which is six foot 10 feet um, from Ebbets and on the second floor, 16 feet from Ebbets and 10 feet from Manila. Um, I didn't see established, which I believe we asked for, that the six foot 10 inch front yard at the first floor is, was pre-existing. 
um, since we can't under this uh, special permit or this uh, waiver process waive the required street wall location with respect to the property line all we do is we move the street line and then you have to measure your required front yard from that point right so we need proof that the house that existed prior to this one that was built without permits um, was located in the same position as this one this one was a lift so it's a little hard to tell from I tried to look at like Google Earth imagery from 2007 I just couldn't figure it out so um, if the applicant could do that and just clear up for us that this house was existing and just lifted in place um, you know and and the DOB is okay um, just a warning on that one DOB sometimes isn't okay with a lift that's in place and then thinking that the non-complying condition um, is a, an existing continued non-complying condition, right? We had some problems with that. I'll build it back. Um, at the last hearing, we also asked for a zoning analysis with respect to the required side yards and permitted obstructions. Um, the plan shows a seven-foot side yard with an obstruction. Um, I, I think it's complying. I think you only need five feet, but I think they need to um, verify that. We don't see it in any of the zoning analyses, and it needs to be. Um, also, uh, they still have a problem with their designation on the flood elevation. Um, so just to be clear, um, FRCE is a level that's located two feet above BFE, otherwise known as base flood elevation. Design flood elevation and what's known as freeboard FRCE can, are often the same. Right, so, so if base flood elevation is 12, then design flood elevation and FRCE have to be 14. Um, so on these drawings, sometimes we see FRCE at 12. In fact, we always see FRCE at 12. That's not correct. Um, so the architect is mixing up their terms. Um, they really need to get a handle on that because that's going to be, that's life these days. Since 2012 going forward, you need to know your FRCEs and BFDs and stuff like that. Um, you see it, Tony? Well, um, yeah, I didn't miss it. They're always saying FRCE is 12. That's not correct. Yeah, I'm sorry, okay. I missed that. Yeah. The zoning lot size is also incorrect. Um, according to the survey and the deed, the lot is 40 by 96, sort of, more or less. Um, so um, instead of 3,200 square feet, the lot size has to be something like 3,800 and change. Uh, so they need to correct that. Um, I also didn't see the DEP sign off yet. Um, they no, are, not yet. Yeah, you got that? No, no. No, so because there was DEP comments um, in June that were prior to the applicant's response in June. So there needs to be DEP. Well, not yet. He submitted to. They submitted the right, we, we sent this to DEP, the August 24th. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right, because he, okay. part of his response was to, whoa, to DEP, sorry. Okay, so you haven't reheard from DEP. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And then the Bureau of President's March comments about the widths of the street weren't all corrected. Um, for example, um, record and map widths for Manila should be 50 feet. One is shown as still as 30. And there are a lot of comments, and it's very detailed, so I didn't go through every single one, but they need to check line by line whether they picked up all the comments that came from the borough president's topographic office, so the comments are correct. <laughs> so. Any other comments on this one? New cases, item number 13, 2017-52A, 1109 Metropolitan Avenue, Brooklyn. Super interesting case. Okay. So we have proof of service of this interpretive appeal to DOB and city planning. Um, so there's kind of an either or question presented here. Um, one is, um, does section 1210 two definition of accessory use that includes caretakers' apartments and describes the conditions under which they are permitted allow such apartments in this M3 zoning district regardless of the specifics of the use. 
as long as it's in a use group 3 to 18 use, or must we determine whether, so the second question is, must we determine whether a caretaker's apartment is clearly incidental to and customarily found in connection with the principal use of a sign painting establishment, which is the second prong of the, that question is a second prong of the three prong test to determine whether a use is accessory as defined in section 1210. Um, DOB does not contest the other two prongs in that test, which have to do with ownership and location of the use. I, I do believe there is a distinction between the articulated list of accessory uses and the general requirement that requires analysis of the three prong test. For example, eating and drinking establishments are not included on that specific list but have been considered accessory to, for example, an apartment hotel or a hospital, as have hair salons and dry cleaners because they are considered you know, commonly associated with those kinds of uses as a convenience, especially in, with respect to apartment buildings, for example, in areas where there's not a lot of commercial services nearby, right? Um, some of the big housing projects that are kind of isolated. In hotels, it's extremely common in apartment hotels, it's extremely common to have like a dry cleaner. Um, bookstores also have been determined to be accessory to universities that are located in residence districts. And many of the articulated uses um, indicate within them, um, so now this is the articulated list, indicates within them the use to which they are customarily found um, to be um, accessory or appear to be listed as generally accept, access, sorry, generally acceptable accessory uses. So they tell you servants' quarters are generally found to be with use group one and two. Swimming pools, generally found with use group one and two. Agricultural storage, clearly generally found in a barn. Um, home occupations, which is a defined term <laughs> in a home. Um, accessory parking and loading berths, always <coughs> accessory to the use for which there is the parking. Ambulance outposts, accessory to a fire department. Electric vehicle charging, and um, accessory to a parking garage. Solar energy systems, notably not specifically accessory to anything because everything should be allowed to have solar energy collectors. Um, others on the list may require further study um, but I don't think there were many on the list to determine whether customarily found like a newsstand. Where is that? Gene? I see it often in an office building, but an office building is a commercial district, so why would that need to be an accessory use? Um, the radio tower being the one that was cited as um, not necessarily always associated with the university. An incinerator in the back in the day, there were incinerators in every apartment building. Um, do they mean an independent gigantic incinerator that might be on a very large site? Um, so I do think that the specificity of the caretaker's apartment in section 12102, where the allowable use groups are listed and conditions of use provided, is a general acknowledgement that such use is always acceptable. In particular, the, lang the, ter the language says, any use in use, any use group mm -hmm. thir three to 18 use may have a caretaker's apartment. We, we've seen the use of any in the zoning resolution all over the place. It's extremely expansive. The board has looked at the word any on other cases and found it to be expansive. So um, I, I guess, you know, then, then the counter argument is does the specificity then permit us to ignore the three-prong test in Section 1210 definition of accessory use? Or are the 1210-2 criteria merely clarifications rather than a direct permission? Um, so, because if it was a direct permission, then why wouldn't a caretaker apartment simply have been listed as a permitted use in use group 3 to 18? You could argue that, right? Um, with respect to DOB's argument that in order to determine whether the proposed caretaker's apartment is customarily found with the same uses in other situations, I do want to note that technology changes and it's possible that today's methods of operation would require 24-hour surveillance, surveillance, whereas yesterday's methods would not have. So caretaker 
needs change with technology. There are some places where the equipment's running all night and you absolutely have to have somebody there and it'll blow up. Um, the appellant appears to require this caretaker for security reasons primarily since it has been burglarized, burglarized five times this year at significant cost. It states it doesn't have a caretaker at its other facility because that facility is more secure and easier to maintain. Um, so I, you could ask, which was asked in the um, notice of comments actually, um, how are the security concerns in this case different from those of other similarly situated businesses that have on-site security guards, security systems, et cetera. Understood that security guards may be more expensive, um, but that isn't really the test. Um, and are the alarm systems hooked up to a central response station? That was something I wanted them to just respond to. That sends out the police and guards to the site when the alarm is tripped. Um, I personally have had lots of experience with this subject, so it, the police always get there after the computer disappears. Not their fault, it's just that these guys are pros. They get in and out really fast, right? <laughs> so, um, um, I'd also like to know what are the hours of operation of the facility, what are the manufacturing methods of the facility, and where is paint stored if not on site? Because they said they only have 20 gallon containers, and how do you paint all those signs with only 20 gallons? Um, the, the ZRD1 referred to an elaborate list of um, operations, which I think they should go into more because they didn't discuss it in their own materials. ZRD1 says um, many, many signs and advertisements are painted overnight or very early in the morning and require that owner's personnel have access to the shop at all hours of the day. A number of the clients are located outside of the city and employees do return to the shop after late arriving flights to return equipment and proprietary designs for the advertisements and so on. So it sh shows that there's actually it's kind of buzzing most of the time. So you do need to have somebody there to be receiving and locking up and all that. Um, and also, I just want to say the incidence of caretaker apartments is actually very broad. And I'm not really seeing the distinction between permitting a caretaker in a banquet hall or a custom manufacturing space and this use um, what might be the reasons other than functioning as a superintendent to have such caretakers in those cases. And if we look at the restrictive decks that were recorded against those properties that are cited by the appellant that have caretakers apartments, the forms are the DOB standard issue, which is the same form that this applicant would use um, or appellant would use, and the caretakers are doing exactly the same thing. They're maintaining the sidewalks, the facades, the mechanicals, taking in the trash. So. I don't see how that's different. Um, and I just wanted to ask both sides of the case whether they researched the legislative history of the caretaker, caretaker apartment text um, prior to the changes that were made to protect the loft dwellings, because it didn't go back very far in history when they submitted that material. Anybody else? Um, I fully agree with you uh, in um, the aspect of you know how, which one do you measure the three prong um, test or the specificity that's been provided and I think we need to look at both of them and and one of the aspect that is telling is that industry is changing and a lot of it that has been written has been written with a time period that was that was known to us then and and the cases that have been submitted indicates that. A lot of these uses that are that are there before were not conceived then, and and because of the nature of use and the operation and the sensitive work that is going on, requires that uh, caretaker work. And who are we to evaluate that this kind of business merits a caretaker unit or not? It's a question, uh, and and therefore this may be the first one. They and and given it's it is an isolated site given that it has a water um, a front uh, on one end, and the other side there is a bridge, and then uh, there is a business which closes down after a certain hour. So it, re it is very remote from that point of view. So give, um, and, and the appeals case has talked about the, you know, the fact base, and then that, and the principal use of the land in question also needs to be weighed in. I think factoring all of those, I, I, yeah, I do think there is a need for the the use need for this um, is is there. 
And it, the question becomes the, the pr second prong of, uh, you know, is it uh, found, one, can't, one shouldn't compare for another. You mean sign customarily? Shop, customarily found. And, and my question is, one should be looking for another sign shop looking for the same operation. It's also the location of the sign shop, the kind of work that there. It's a location and other use and the specific work that is going on. And if a similar kind of uh, op uh, uses uh, that are also remotely located that have sensitive work in the, in, in those locations or machineries in those sites that require constant investigation and supervision, I think there is a match. Mm -hmm. And I do think that should be applied in terms of determining the customer aspect of it. Um, that's how I am assessing mm -hmm. the situation. Um, I just have difficulty um, agreeing with DOB's requirement of showing precedent for, in particular, our caretakers unit, um, a caretakers unit in a sign shop because it fails to take into account the fact that industry is always changing. And so then the first person on the block, so to speak, is always going to suffer because there's no exactly. way to draw any kind of comparison with a similar situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I agree with the other points previously said. OK. Thank you. May I move on? Yeah. Zoning calendar decision items. Item number 14, 322 13BZ, 4201 Main Street, Queens. Another one that's been going on forever. Okay. So, um, so at the last hearing in June, we were very, 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 um, frustrated with this application because we were getting information that was dribs and drabs and we talked about then um, disclosing this so that we put it on for a decision and everybody votes however they think they should vote and not drag this out any further. Um, um, in response to those comments at the review session, um, the applicant's counsel came and essentially requested one last chance, right? And so in response to the one last chance, we got a little more of a drab <laughs> or a drib, not sure which. They paid the fines, which have been overdue for the three years or something that we've had this year. 11 hearings um, over the course of two years. Um, and so they did pay the fines. I verified this that the fines have been paid. Nevertheless, of course, the violations are all continuing to be outstanding. Many of them have to do with the extension of this use, but on the other hand, we know there's this alteration application that's still floating around in some sort of limbo place. Um, they did provide photos that they show the asphalt was repaved, sort of. Um, so they repaved it where they repaved it and didn't repave it where they didn't. Um, uh, and um, Meanwhile, there's no stackers installed, which is part of the requirement to comply with zoning. Um, I don't know if any of any any other commissioners have visited the site in the last few I months. Thought, I, I didn't realize that we were requiring them to provide the stackers. I thought that would be part of the conditions that they, put, that they would provide no. because they would need. They the, cannot do it now. They need. I, I thought they needed some DOB. Um. No, no, no. The DOP approval is has to do with occupying the mezzanine level of the space inside. That's the alteration. But the stackers are because they don't have enough parking on site. Yeah, right. 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 Yes. But I thought that I that was not my understanding that that was a requirement that they had to fulfill prior to the BSA approval. Well, it's that at the moment they're not in compliance with the required the amount of parking, right? right? right. right. So we've been trying to get them for all low these many years to bring the site into some sort of semblance of care. Right. And, and my understanding was they would have to improve all the other site conditions, but the stackers was not one of them, but that, that, that they had to provide that. 
but it was <coughs> that I didn't understand. But that's a zoning requirement. Yes, I know that. Yeah. I'm not questioning that. It's just a so question how can we approve it if there is a violation? It was going to be condition of that. But they may never put them in, and then so this a okay. yes. So this site has a history of I, I doing nothing and not coming back here to extend and building illegally, et cetera, et cetera. That's why it's been here this long, because we keep saying, well, fix this thing and fix this thing and install this thing. And then they do one, you know, they want, they do a bush and then they come back with a picture of a bush. And then they see in the picture that the fence is broken, so then they fix the fence, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what's been going on for all this time. Um, so, so anyway, I think we both, we've all like had enough of this application. So we closed this. So I just want to bring it to a vote and we'll see what happens based on, you know, and just to remind the only thing that this application is for is to allow parking in the residential district. Mm -hmm. So if they weren't given an extension, they'd simply have to take the parking out of the residential district and go figure out how to have this right. illegal use, right. you know, someplace else. We actually, at some point, they started looking for parking sites off-site, and then they abandoned that, you know. So it's been, it's been a long time. So everyone, just whatever you guys think, and <laughs> and, I'll, and and we'll um, act accordingly according to how the vote goes. Okay. Item number 15, 2016, 4299 BZ, 280 Richard Street, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this one, um, they did submit a revised parking study. So this one actually is closed, though I do think we might need to reopen to just discuss okay. some issues because there were things about the parking study that I um, didn't quite follow. Um, so a revised parking study um, was submitted that continues to insist that the utilization rate for this location will be based on a 40% auto share because they say that the kinds of people who are going to commute to this site will actually rely more on the taxi Uber Lyft phenomenon, which by the way assumes quite a well-to-do worker population and that might be asking a lot of your design tech sector being from that sector, I could never afford to go to work every day using a Lyft so, or an Uber. Um, so, um, and um, also I think that the, the reality of the design tech sector is spread throughout both Brooklyn and Queens. So they're coming from really all over the place because that sector looks for inexpensive housing to the extent you can find it which is in the furthest reaches of the city of New York, if you're still in the city of New York. So that means they're going to be coming by subway. And if subway is really inconvenient, they'll be driving their cars or, or something, right? So, so in response kind of to those comments, they also added a portion to their parking study to show a 47% auto share that represents the Red Hook area, okay? Um, so that results in terms of what they're proposing in a buffer in terms of the number of parking spaces mm -hmm. they're providing of only 39 empty spaces during peak. So that starts to get tight because we're not talking about, you know, a total of 50 spaces and 39 are empty. We're talking about over a thousand spaces and only 39 are left. So, um, or maybe it's almost a thousand spaces. So one of my questions is, they, there's an assumption of 24 to 26% of the trips coming by subway. So that works when you're talking about um, the Navy Yard because one of the subway stops is a not unreasonable walking distance. It's like a 15 minute walk to one end of the Navy Yard. And so, you know, it's a nice walk, it's not that bad. And it takes you to the one end of the Navy Yard where maybe that's where your office is and you don't, you're not walking a mile and a half. On the other hand, this one, the, clo the only subway stop, is really, really far. So um, I'm trying to understand how you use the 24 to 26% subway split when the subway's that far away. And the bus split doesn't, isn't affected accordingly because it seems to me most people, at the very least, would want to get on a bus right there at the subway. And if they can't, then they're going to come some other way. 
So it, it seems to me that the subway split should get distributed someplace else because not as many people are going to come by subway because it's in the middle of January, come by subway. No. So, um, so some of that goes to why you need the shuttle bus, right? So I would totally believe the 26% split if there's every 10 minutes there's a shuttle bus that picks you up and brings you to work. Mm -hmm. Totally believable. Then I would say the split would go up because it would be great, right? So that then goes to the, their suggestion about um, at what point they'll kick in the shuttle bus. Um, they're saying at a 50% occupancy rate of the building. So I don't actually know because everything is done by trips. I don't know what the actual population of the building is assumed to be when it's 50% occupied, right? Because we, we look at trips, we don't look at, um, we don't look at actual population. So um, I would like them to explain, like when we say 50% occupancy, how many thousands of people are we talking about who up until the, at 49% will have to walk from the subway. It wouldn't be roughly half, because isn't the trip generation based on the square right, footage right. at what, 18? Yeah, it is, but it's eight, It's trips per thousand. It's 18 right. trips per thousand, which includes um, people who are coming and going every single day, as opposed to how many people are going to work. You know, it, it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a different I was, calculus. I was looking at it from the point of view of that from the 50% um, occupancy point is then the parking space that's there, the demand for the parking space, um, uh, or look at it the other way around. Up to 50%, there is enough parking space on site that would accommodate the, uh, the 40 uh, up to the 50% um, occupancy of the building. It's after that where I guess the management of the space becomes more critical. And that's where that's when the the shuttle bus service gets provided to discourage people from driving and parking there, and to allow for that. So as long as up to the 50 percent there was enough capacity on the site to allow for that parking space, I thought that was a pretty reasonable cutoff point. Uh -huh. That's how I was. Looking yeah, at I was looking at it that there would be half the demand, and right. so yeah. if you have 39 spots available with full demand, you would have probably. 500 right. something spots available at half of the time. Right. That's what I so, was thinking. So then what I'm curious about, this has more to do with like human factors, right? So I'm one of the 50, I'm there as the 50% group and there's no shuttle bus. So I'm not taking the subway because it's a total drag. So I make sure that somehow I have a car, you know, now I have a car or at least I'm part of a bunch of people who have a car. and we start driving. So now we've developed a habit. And I'm, why would I change my habit after there's a shuttle bus? Or would I change my habit? So, you know, have you then cha affected your modal split? Because the absence of a shuttle bus may result in more than 47% of the Correct. people yeah. using an auto. And perhaps right. it should be up to 75%. So then you would say half the demand plus add a quarter back in or more of an auto split. You probably would still have a few hundred free spaces. At the, at the 50%, but when you put the 100% in, or it's never 100%. Oh, because you're saying that even with the shuttle bus now, people will still drive. Yeah, people will drive because they got conditioned. Right. And that was, that was why I... I didn't really understand why you wouldn't just order, offer the shuttle bus kind of right away. Um, it's not that big of an expense, so that you're not shifting behavior. Um, you know, people get used to their cars. It's so nice. It's my home within a home kind of thing. I can keep all my stuff there, and the subway is just what you have on your back, right? So I don't know. I don't really understand why the applicant is sort of cheaping out on the shuttle bus you know, what it, What would it really take? And you don't necessarily, it's not necessarily a shuttle bus with six shifts. You can do a nine to five shuttle bus at the beginning and you could have it more as just a one person's shift. So, I don't, so, and then um, we do need an up, the environmental is still bumpy, right? Yeah, there's um, a few comments from DCP that need to be addressed. 
Okay. Um, and the applicant has those, but they came in very late on Friday. Oh, they did. They actually. Oh, DCP's comments came in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Late Friday. Yeah. So, um, but they're. I believe maybe they can address them before tomorrow. Okay. I'll keep you posted. Great. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. All right. Continued hearing items, item number 16, 128 to 15BZ, 130 15BZ. This is Van Dusen Street in Staten Island. Okay. Another confusing legal question. The applicant submitted a letter stating that the board cannot force it to obtain title to the adjacent property and describing the elaborate process that would be required to do so. So. In the first place, the applicant is correct. The board cannot force it to do anything. But this is a variance application where the current owner or predecessor in title created the hardship complained of, which in this case is a narrow, deep lot with limited access. Then I believe the variance has to fail under the D finding. And all evidence points to a clear conveyance of a 15 by 300 by 25 by 300 parcel adjacent to the subject parcel to the current owners. So I don't know what anybody's talking about that they need to obtain title. They have title. I believe the title company and the lawyers who were responding to um, this, who submitted this letter, um, we're responding to the wrong question. The board did not ask that the owner obtain title to the entirety of Lot 389, that's known as Broad Street, only that it clarify that the portion of Lot 89 that was conveyed to it by deed is part of the subject property and include that as the access to the site. With respect to the additional costs that are related to opening that small portion of the property as a driveway, um, and so they're complaining that that's going to be too expensive and it makes the site not viable. Um, those costs do not include credits for work that would not have to be done for the proposal without the driveway or um, that are um, already included in the overall costs of the project. Um, for example, and also like there's no retaining wall shown in the proposed version along the side lot lines. I don't actually understand how how you do that work without a retaining wall. Um, but for instance, um, you know, for instance, there's a little driveway that goes up directly from Van Duzer in the proposed. You wouldn't need to build that. That would just be a grassy knoll, right? So, so that should get a credit. There's certain things that get credited. In addition, um, the parking situation is vastly improved by including four interior parking spaces that improves the marketability of the units. And the depth of the front yard along Van Duzer could actually be reduced. So you can extend the building, either move it forward, so you have to do less on the lot, or um, you could make the building longer. That's sort of your option, design option, since you don't need to park there. Um, and that could allow also um, the extension of the site, I mean, including that little part portion, increases the floor area of the buildings, right? Um, it's also, at the very moment, those buildings are underbuilt at 0.36 FAR, um, and with the enlarged lot, that each home would be increased further. So mm -hmm. there's benefit. It actually would make more money, right, if we're working on a per square foot sale. Um, and in addition, including the driveway along Broad Street will improve safety at this intersection and greatly improve the project's relationship to the neighborhood. And by the way, city planning also wanted this to be the access point. So, yeah. Um, I, I do agree with you that the access on Van Duzer is kind of complicated for the driver. It requires that the driver would back out because there really isn't any way to turn around given there are two two homes that share that parking pad so it'd be very especially with the tandem parking would be very difficult to make a u-turn on the property which means you have to back off of the property and van Dusa street it doesn't have a real service lane where you could back into like a parking lane or a service lane you would be backing right into a drive lane and that would be a problem 
So whereas I do sometimes, I, I see curb cuts for homes where cars are required to back out, a lot of the times they're backing out into a situation where there's, there's less uh, moving vehicles that would provide a conflict. So I'm actually, I think I kind of agree with you that you know, access from broad would be better. And I do agree certainly that if you incorporate that floor area into, you know, that lot into your overall zoning lot, it gives you the additional floor area for building. And that's a good thing. I, the only thing I would see that would perhaps have to change would be the IA finding would have to morph a little bit from being narrow and deep to just being deep and sloped. Yeah. And I don't think that would be a problem because that's still a pretty unique finding. And then they can focus all of their concentration on either the cost to level or the cost to create all of these retaining walls to hurt, hold the dirt in place. And we've had cases like that before where simply the slope and the cost to provide retaining walls to keep everything in place and keep the site, the site stable is enough of a hardship. Yeah. So um, I do have financial questions. Since there's going to be another go around, I think the applicant should just um, pay heed to these comments. First of all, in terms of the site value, they're only valuing what they consider to be usable area. And that's not how we traditionally value the site value. We do it based on the max floor area that could be built on a site, given the zoning. If you're trying to get at the fact that only a portion of that site is usable, you can get at that through adjusting comparables downward to account for the lack of utility of part of the lot. But you don't do it by just valuing less of the square footage that can be built. Um, also, the adjustments that they use to their comparables, I'm not in agreement with. The first two comps are 30 by 100 for vacant lots, which are adjusted upwards for size and also utility saying, that these comps are smaller and more narrow and so they're worth less, but I don't agree because they are perfectly regular standard lots at 3,000 square feet and they're um, level, normal width, regular shape. So to me there should be no upward adjustment for size and utility because the subject site is narrow and deep and extremely sloped or at least deep and extremely sloped. So if anything there should, should be worth less than the comparables. So I would say all the comparables should be adjusted down for utility. I think that the lack or the incorrect adjustment here is actually driving the average price per square foot of buildable space upwards and as a result the site value is higher than it really should be. Now I've made a comment previously about the construction costs including the profit and overhead. And what I wanted to see was the profit and overhead separated out so that this way it would be clear to check whether or not these construction costs are high with respect to industry standards. And so just like in the previous report, they're really not pulling out the profit and overhead. And also there isn't any gross building area listed anywhere that I could use to as a check also to make sure that the price per square foot isn't abnormally high. So I'd like to see that. So I really do understand the A case and I'm persuaded by it. However, I still think that the development costs are driven upwards by a high site value and possibly high construction costs for each scenario. And so therefore, I'm, I'm not convinced yet that they've met the B or the E fine. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. um, I was looking at the the approach from the broad street more from a safety and security. And I think this is something, um, if, I mean, if we were to look at broad street, we should ask the um, DOB to weigh in on it and ensure that the location of the curb cut and it uh, would- DOB or DOT? I'm sorry, DOT. Yeah. Um, DOT to ensure that um, you know the location of the curb cut and placement of it would uh, allow for yeah. a safe and secure situation because this would require relocation of the existing the light, uh, light yeah. the traffic light, and there is another street light. Um, I am a little concerned about the broad street access because if a vehicle is exiting the premise, um, the broad street, traffic from broad street will only turn left. And when it turns left, because of the way it's angled, um, uh, at the time when it's a signalized intersection, uh, a vehicle that is trying to exit the site 
we'll have to weave through the broad street traffic that is turning, trying to turn left. Turn left. Um, turn left to Van Duzer. Mm. Why will it turn? Have to turn left? Why because Van Duzer is one way? one way. Are you talking about with the access from Port Street or with the access from Van with the Duzer? access from Broad Street? So uh, Van Duzer is one way. Right, but that'll be a signaled intersection yeah. where... So then it will have to be a three-way. So that's a, DOB, a DOT Why question. Why would it have to be a three-way so, uh, so either it's a... So if you have a red green on broad, mm -hmm. so vehicles on broad are only going to turn left mm -hmm. onto Van Duzer. Yeah. So when they're turning left on Van Duzer, vehicle from the site cannot exit. Uh, because there is, it cannot weave through it. It can only make a right turn to go to Van Duzer. Why but can't it weave through it like you would with any intersection that mm -hmm. has two-way traffic? People who are proceeding straight always have the right of way. People who are making turns always wait for the person going straight. So why couldn't the people exiting Broad I think Street, if they want to go straight, so you they just naturally so the take question, the right of way? So the question becomes, it's for DOT to evaluate that, ensure that that yeah. turning, uh, that that uh, through movement on Broad, Broad Street from the site will not create an additional... But that's the traffic rules of, of the city, of the state, of the country. It's I'm not denying that. Right, I'm not so denying but, that. I just want to make sure... To kick that out to DOT when it's the rule, it's the law. Well, first of all, DOT has looked at a plan where it has allowed for two sets of curb cuts on Van Duzer. Now, the proposal before us, it's only one set of curb cut on Van Duzer, and we are proposing that that curb cut be moved further from the intersection before the Broad and Van Duzer into the intersection of Broad and Van Duzer. Yeah. So we do need to make sure that DOT is okay with that curb cut being located on the intersection of Broad and Van Duzer. That's all I'm but saying. But it would be yeah. like the and street. It's really going to be like the street. It is. I mean, it's, it's not it's, a curb It's cut. on one half of the extension of Broad. So what we're doing is we're opening up a map street, right? So because originally, that, I have the plan here, originally Broad went all the way, th right. all the way through right. it up the mountain, right? So, so this is opening up one side of a map street to allow it to go. The so people will have to the way the it'll either the go to the is, right. The curb cut will be. It will have to swing into Van Duzer and then swing back into Broad Street. I'm just cautioning this in terms of the how the movement into would Van be. Duzer? Yes, it'll have to go a little bit into Van Duzer before it can make a left onto Broad Street because you cannot just make into the Broad Street because the angle of the curb cut is still away from the mouth of the Broad Street, unless the property is acquired even further out to match with the Broad Street intersection. Okay, so anyway, the point so, is that DOT has been looking at this anyway, um, and so obviously we always, re we always reach right. out to DOT on all of these questions, but, um, but DOT already, with the borough president, mapped Broad Street as a through street that cuts through Van Duzer. So had the owners of Broad Street chosen to, chosen to open it and have houses on two sides like it was originally planned to do, it would have gone through and that signalized intersection would have said, you know, you guys stop and you guys go, right? So they'll still have a signalized intersection because they're going to move that light. Um, mm -hmm. And that intersection will then address whatever the patterns are. I mean, obviously, DOT will be looking yeah, at Yeah, I just this. want to make sure DOT is right. OK. <laughs> but I think what, what we often see with DOT is they make do with the situation. They, they, they don't forbid it. They make do with it. And so this is a situation where both we and city planning have said, why make do if there's a better, a safer solution than having curb cuts where everybody has to back out onto an active through mm -hmm. route? Okay. Move on? Yeah. Item number 17, 2016, 4127 BC, 1547 East 26th Street, Brooklyn.
Um, they requested an adjournment. Item number 18, 2016, 4138 DC, 32327, Avenue of the Americas, CIFC Theater. Okay, sorry, scrolling takes a bit. Here, okay. So, in response to our comments at the February 28th hearing, the applicant submitted a number of new lesser variant scenarios uh, or scenaria. These include um, converting this theater to retail and developing residential on Cornelia Street, um, which resembles to um, different degrees versions that were submitted to us um, prior to the February hearing. Um, the submission also includes different versions of theater exper expansions, primarily located within the C overlay district with residential development facing Cornelia Street. Um, Version 4C um, appears to be promising um, and actually improves circulation within the theater itself, dramatically improves circulation. Um, adding, and it seems to me that in terms of um, kind of, let's say, seat counts or retail floor area or whatever, adding two theaters in the cellar of the 4C structure um, or one larger theater that's like the five version um, would exceed, um, would improve the seat count um, and actually exceed the seat count over the proposed um, and would place the commercial building massing towards Sixth Avenue where it arguably belongs. Um, feel free to jump in at any time. Oh, good, good. Because <laughs> <laughs> when you look at the layout of 4C, because I actually am in agreement with you, 4C builds in, it actually is a great layout up on the new upper floors, but it builds in to me a lot more extra gross area than is actually needed because number one, it throws a bunch of bathrooms up on both floors and then space that they block out, which is I guess entry and exit into the bathrooms, and then adds in a lot of waiting space that isn't required based on the seat count on both of those floors. and Basically, I think they can actually constrict the floor plate, which would lower the gross square footage, which would, if you then increase the number of seats in the cellar, would increase the efficiency of this building. And if you do increase the efficiency past the 30% threshold that the financial analyst discusses, it actually kicks it into a higher rent. So. I'm wondering, I have other financial comments, yeah, yeah. but I'm wondering if, like you yeah. said, this might actually be a solution that is embraced by the community as well. And I also wanted to add that in going through the papers again, I noted, I want to note that the Sunshine Theater only has 855 seats. So I don't know necessarily that this theater would need to have much more than 855. So even just at 840 seats, it at least becomes comparable to somebody who they consider a competitor. Right. And the, but that's again going to the programmatic need. Right, versus right. The no, commercial. I know, but I was right. just talking about in terms of, you know, if they then argue back, well, we need a thousand seats, blah, blah, right. blah, to increase efficiency. You don't just have to increase efficiency by increasing the number of seats. You can increase efficiency by lowering the envelope of the building, making the envelope of the building smaller, lessening the gross square footage, because that's the other part of the ratio. Right, right. And so to, and to pick up on the 4C, um, 4C has two elevators, it has two separate concession areas, it's things that the, propo the proposed now has a second concession area, but it's squished inside in a very inconvenient location. Um, and also 4C has, at the moment, two on each floor, two much larger theaters, and we understood that smaller theaters were more desirable, so you could actually subdivide those larger theaters into three instead of two, so you'd have more theaters. Um, that's, their, that's their call, but from a, from a floor area perspective, or let's say a, a usable area perspective, um, the proposed still has a really terrible circulation problem. And we had talked about on the proposed eliminating the, one of the theaters on the second floor because it was creating this tight sort of tunnel between the theaters 
which made for quite a dangerous waiting situation, and they didn't take out that theater. Um, so it's not really, it's again not pairing. I think actually opposition said pineapples to mangoes. So it is pineapples to mangoes because you have far a much more sort of roomy solution on 4C, and if that's not so necessary for the success of the theater, that either you take, or if it is necessary, then the proposed needs to be roomy like that. And if it isn't necessary, then it could be tighter. Um, but it shouldn't be tighter to the extent of being dangerous. But and even arguably, you might be able to eliminate one of the floors of the theater by being more efficient on the third floor addition on 4C, getting in more theaters, and because small is good too, right? Having less circulation, fewer toilets, et cetera, et cetera. Because either you need a lot of toilets or you don't need a lot of toilets. But in the proposed, they don't have a lot, and in 4C, they have a lot. So I don't know what the correct operational requirements are, but one of them's right and one of them isn't. Um, the also, um, what I did want to say, even though financials I only touch on a little bit, the the applicant is arguing that the costs for the 4C far exceed the cost for the proposed by like $6 million. Um, I'm curious how much of that is attributable to the residential development. So if you, if you just looked at, um, what if you didn't build a residential development at all? What if you build um, a cellar level theater under, underneath the residential side and maybe one, the one level of lobby on that residential side and nothing above it, in which case then um, you eliminate all those costs from having to do kitchen and bathroom fit outs and all that for high end residential. If that's where your big cost is, then no reason to build it. Um, so that, but maybe that's really not the question, I don't know. Um, and, but it certainly eliminates a lot of the construction costs. Well, yeah, but that as well as making the commercial building more efficient upstairs also does. So yeah, right. that one way or the other. Yeah. I think it's crazy not to build a residential because it is the village. <laughs> um, you know, it'd be kind of amazing. Never mind. Um, also, uh, what else did I leave out? Okay. Okay, that was it. Did you want to? I think I agree to disagree with you. Okay. <laughs> agree to disagree. Um, and, uh, and I disagree on the ground that uh, 4C, while may seem viable, um, the, as you indicated, the cost is prohibitive. And if I seem to remember in, in earlier discussions, um, the manager had indicated that um, any building over uh, the existing structure, I mean, every alternatives that were, at least in the proposed alternatives that were submitted, were submitted where the uses were located around and behind the existing facility, not over the existing facility. And the reason for that was to, um, that A, it would require relocating all the AC and all the mechanical system, and possibly um, uh, shutting down the existing two large theaters to put the structure through to allow for the expansion vertically on 6th Avenue. And that was not explained in the documentation. I would like the right. apl applicant to clarify that. And I would think that is probably adding to the cost of the construction, not so much the four, two, uh, four residential units on the, on the Car uh, Carnelia site. It's really trying to build over an existing theater. And I don't know whether this solution looked at the possibility of keeping the existing theater operational while the construction was going on and all of that, and I'm, if that is building into the cost of it or not. And my, my feeling is that's what it is, but I would like the applicant to mm -hmm. clarify that. I go back to my basic comment of what is driving this pro proposal. Um, it seems from the discussion so far I've heard, we are being driven by the fact that this, what has been established that Cornelia is a residential street. I fully disagree with that. It is not a residential street. It is a mixed use street. It is a street that has, that has over 60% of non-residential uses on the ground floor. And it has a very mixed type of building typology of all different sizes and heights on Cornelia Street. Um, the way the zoning is mapped 
and where it you it's um it's currently being used it is anything but all residential mm -hmm. it has a very active vibrant commercial use on cornelia street and the fact that that particular subject block is not a typical city block where it tapers off um, on Cornelia and the way the zoning maps uh, wraps around it, it wraps around more than 100 feet from the intersection of Cornelia and Six. So thereby you're, we're, you're, you have the commercial use that has come in way into the middle of the block and it's not just at the bookend of 100 feet that one typically sees. So with that in, and, and in addition to that, there are a lot of non-residential non uses, mm -hmm. in, not in the map section of it. So with that premise, I do not agree that, that one has to see a residential use on that 52-foot frontage of the site to make this site, um, to make this um, building um, cohesive and, 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 and be part of that block front. The, this particular site right now has a blank wall. What, what is being proposed? is a wall that at the ground floor will be very much visually activated as opposed to a blank wall and that would contain uses above that may not that unlike what we always visualize would be just a blank box of a theater facing you it would be a much more animated activated a wall through various lighting schemes as LPC had reviewed with a, a forms and shapes that would be much more harmonious with the building forms that are on Cornelia Street. Going back to, so there, that goes back to the question of the neighborhood character and is it necessary to have residential, I do not think it is mm -hmm. necessary to have residential use on that block. I think the proposal mo as, as modified um, has uh, is responsive to the neighborhood built form of Cornelia and allows for activation without adding pedestrian circulation, which was a huge concern of the community. And the uses that are there currently on Cornelia adds a lot of commercial foot traffic, which this proposal would not, and which is what the community wanted. And the applicant has been responsive to it. My concerns with this project was a lot to do with the interior circulation, which was one of the reasons that the application also they want to expand, allow for better circulation. And I think through these iteration and the last iteration, where they have moved the staircase away from that center and have created a more of a flow and allow for a much larger catchment area on the ground floor is uh, is a is a viable and a better solution than what was submitted, which I think is proposal five. Um, and there's so many numbers. Which, I, I, which is five? No, proposal five six. Has the apartments. Yeah. N no, not proposal five. Six no, no, no. Proposal. It's proposal. Yes, thank you, thank you. Proposal six. It's proposal six. And also in... Sorry, what about Proposal 6? Uh, the Proposal 6 has been responsive to the concerns that I had raised, which is uh, regard, uh, with regards to the circulation. Uh, Even on the circulation. second floor where they didn't take it, away Theater 3? It has three? been widened. It has been much more widened. And, the contain, and I think the widening of the ground floor circulation space by moving the staircase away and allows for much more gathering space on the ground floor. So the way... Um, in many of these smaller theaters, it has, um, at least some of the ones that I've been to, is the bigger catchment area is really on the ground floor. And then as the movies uh, are about to start, you start filtering them into the upper floor with, few, uh, with a little bit of a remaining catchment area on the floors above. So the main gathering area is really downstairs. And once you start going upstairs, it's just the remaining little bit that you need the dribs and drabs for the other one. So I feel this is, this is an improvement. Um, the, with regards to the efficiency of the seats to the gross floor area, the applicant's document indicates the 4C, while it allows for bigger space, the efficiency is much worse than the existing conditions. So I'm not sure how we can say that that is, um, I cannot see that then therefore being a winning solution if the efficiency is not being improved um, with, uh, with that proposal. Um, so I think the applicant has been very responsive mm -hmm. to all, all the questions that um, I have heard being raised. 
it has been very responsive in establishing finding A, which is that there is unique, and, very, and I really was appreciative of this analysis that has been looked at, where it looked at um, converting the co theater into just commercial use and allowing an as of right residential building, or a, th a theater with the residential building, kind of going to show that an as of right solution on this site just would not have been viable because of the unique conditions this site has, the, the, the unusual, irregular block, the zoning way it's mapped, the existing building, being in a historic district, the existing building cannot be torn down, may complicate well, we the site. Sorry, the existing building is a non-contributing building, so that, but, no, but, no, 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 that's a non-contributing building, so okay. leave that one out. Okay, okay. fine. But, um, but right. building an existing, uh, building into an existing building okay. allow, adds to the compli uh, sure. complexity. Mm -hmm. I was looking, right. initially I thought, well, let me look at just that lot on Cornelia Street uh, as a standalone lot and see, can, would, can one build on that site as of right? It's a 50 foot deep site, so it's a very shallow lot. And even using the shallow lot rules, what one would get is actually what the applicant is proposing. It's four, four units, um, one on each floor kind of thing. It's not going to be much, um, much more than that. So what we are pushing is a situation driven by a, a, a lot that only has a 50, that, that has a 52 foot width a lot, and this Cornelia Street frontage, which is much more an over like I said, 65% of that frontage has non-commercial use. So will this use create such a um, degree of uh, neighborhood character issues? I do not believe so. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if designed properly, which, it, which is being monitored by LPC, uh, would lend itself to be a use that would be very compatible and would allow for this theater to grow and improve its circulation and performance. And as the applicant has indicated, there's so many such small theaters which is needed in a place like city of New York where they are closing down because of other market pressures and other, other things, that such niche theater is very much needed. There will be need for various types and shapes and uh, configuration of theater spaces. So I just I'm wanna, I just wanna say, I'm not being driven by neighborhood character. At the very beginning, I. I thought that the character of a small structure on Camellia Street works within the character. I'm looking at how you get through the A and the B first, because that's how we start. I, so, let me right. just, so, so when we look at the A and the B, and we had all these problems with circulation of the building, and we said we're looking at the minimum variance necessary, which is what you're trying to do, right? then why can't you accomplish this thing all on the C district? That reduces the amount of variances, right? So that was the question that was presented. We were initially told it can't be put on the C side for reasons that had to do with the landmark. We found out that it's not a reason to do with the landmark. So we asked them to look at putting more of the theater on the C side, which would therefore reduce the the scope of the waivers, which is what we're supposed to do when we look at a variance, right? And then, okay, so that's right. independent that, of that the neighborhood character. To, right, I, I think and, that goes back to the, the first thing that I raised was the 4C, the question, and the applicant should have been a lot clearer in right. its documentation, is that is, will that result in uh, closing the operation, existing operation of the theaters, and, 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 what, uh, and the cost of, uh, what so, is driving the cost So of then it? you also have to look at the fact that we can't look at, remember, the programmatic needs of the theaters because the theater is a tenant and the property ownership is a commercial owner who needs to make a reasonable return on the investment on this site that is a weirdly shaped site with a strange building on it. Those are the, those are the, that's the, that's the A finding, right? The owner owns this piece of property, which is a weird shape right. with an and existing building on it, et cetera, et cetera. And his job, his or her job, right. is to make a reasonable return through renting, mm -hmm. which is right. right? And so their we're financial not analysis have indicated that the as of right commercial use on this facility with the residential in the back does not result in reasonable return. Right? Well, no. that's well, actually, that's no, that's what her, that's what she, that that's what Dara's doing. Yet. 
at least not by me, maybe mm -hmm. by you, but not by me. I right. still have questions. I, I will let you so, do All right, so let's do the, so the B. I would yeah. like to raise my B questions. Right. All right, so I still have questions about the site value. Although the methodology was, and this is something that I stated after the very first hearing. Although the methodology was addressed, there are still comparables with the viable buildings on them. That's driving the value of the site higher. There are no new comparables. There's no new analysis. The site value is the same as it was. So that's my first issue. Now, some of my questions have to do with the fact that I found that the opposition put forth a very compelling report. And so I'm kind of asking questions based on both of these reports. The opposition made an argument that the cap rates used by the um, applicant were too high. The applicant responded by saying that you can't use the fallout cap rates from existing developments because this is a new investment and so therefore there are a lot of unknowns that add to the risk. However, the applicant's response ignores the fact that this project involves the enlargement of an existing business and so therefore the cap rate should be lower. This is not a, a blind investment into a property and we don't know what's going on. So there's less risk. Exactly. Okay. There's less risk here because a lot of the investment is existing and it's just enlarging existing basically based on incredible demand. Now um, I had a question about the hard construction costs of the different scenarios, but most especially scenario 4C and, and 5, because each of them have a construction cost that is $450 a square foot versus the proposed, which is $300 a square foot. And the reason for that, of course, is because both 4C and 5 have two floors of new construction on top of the existing theater, plus a lot of, I guess, support steel trusses and that kind of situation. Whereas, um, plus a new residential building on it, whereas six is just a renovation of existing space. But my argument is that if you minimize the amount of new theater space that actually needs to be construction, uh, constructed, that should actually lessen the hard and soft construction costs and also lift the theater efficiency rates over 30%, which is a threshold that the applicant talks about. Um, I save my largest comments for the residential rates. The opposition makes the correct case that the applicant's comparables are not only in a lesser location, but are much smaller at about 300 square feet for the studios and 600 square feet for the two bedrooms, without there being either any size adjustment or um, uh, you know, a division of the rents by the amount of square footage to arrive at a price per square foot that could then be applied to a larger apartment. And this actually downgrades the value of the lesser variance residential building. Now, the, opposite, uh, the applicant contends that they um, actually use their lesser located comparables, but then adjusted upwards and added and ended up with a higher rent per month for studios and then for two bedrooms and actually the opposition. Now, oh. it's very interesting because when I went back to the first report to actually look at those original comparables which were in the East Village, it seems as if the, the, you know, the comparables were adjusted and ended up with a price of $2,853 a monthly for studios and $5,200 $10 monthly for two bedrooms. However, they ended up using $3,205 for studios and $6,250 for two bedrooms. And I'm not even sure how they got there. Like, I don't know how they adjusted upwards. It's not explained at all. So you don't I don't find look, it in the, you, right? I, I you looked don't find everywhere it the, and right. I can't find out how they settled for that higher price. In any case, they did settle for a higher price, but we just don't know if it's an arbitrary adjustment at this point. Then, um, in, a le in a later report, the applicant responded to the opposition's listing of comparables in the West Village because the opposition basically said, stated like I did, that the comparables in the East Village are not comparable and should not be used, and there's got to be stock in the West Village that you can use to base your rents on. So the applicant looked at the opposition comparables 
and adjusted all of those different comparables downwards um, to account for the lack of view, the lack of amenities. So for instance, for studios, there is a minus 10% adjustment for amenities. However, in two bedrooms, there's a minus 15% adjustment for amenities. Well, why more of an adjustment for two bedrooms than for studios? That seems arbitrary. And to me, it actually looks like it's designed to back into the original rental assumptions that were in the first report that I'm not even sure how that they arrived at that. Now, um, I think that it was really interesting to note that, and I this passed me by the first time, the comparables used in the East Village were much smaller than the subject apartments. And that's really important to note because none of those comparable, well, none of those comparables were adjusted upwards for size. And so basically, if they're saying that the apartments rent for $2,853 and they should be, that should be used as a basis to value what's here at 6th Avenue, it's just not going to work because the, the apartments on Cornelia Street are actually twice the size of all of those comparables. And so then the, you know, those comparable rents are way off. Mm -hmm. So the um, applicant actually then rebutted the opposition's report and basically said that um, they felt that, that the square footages in the Becker Rubin report were wrong. And they actually corrected those square footages and got a probably an average price per square foot of about eighty dollars a square foot, and that that's what um, Becker Rubin should have come up with as a factor for determining the rent. Well, I got to tell you, if you use that eighty dollars a square foot factor and you apply it to the size of the studios and the size and square footage of the two bedrooms you end up with like $4,266 a month rent for the studio and $7,466 a month rent for two bedroom, which means wow. that the income that they've assumed is too low. low. Right. And so therefore, that's kind of still in play. That what, what's the studio proposed now? Um, $3,200. Okay. So it's like a difference of $1,000 yeah. a month. Right. It's it's sizable amount where, you know, it can have an impact on the financials. Mm -hmm. And that coupled with the cap rate, which I think is too high, like the opposition states, and needs to be adjusted downward, maybe not as low as 4.5%. Mm -hmm. I still don't think that they're there in terms of meeting the B and the E finding. I think also I think that the the applicant needs to start with getting better comparables across the board, be it the vacant lot comparables or the residential comparables, they need to get more appropriate comparables, minimize the amount of adjustments because the comparables should be as truly comparable as they can be. And then we can look from there. I just have to say, the more time that the applicant digs in their feet with assumptions that I'm really not convinced by, the more time they give fuel to the fire for the opposition to provide a very good analysis of, of the way things should look here. And I also want to state that the um, opposition did find an error in one of the scenarios where the wrong cap rate was used from the stated cap rate. And that actually showed that one of the scenarios was more or less feasible. Mm -hmm. And so you know, the applicant also has to ensure that when they do submit something to us that they check through for errors. Right. And I just want to add to Commissioner Shonda's point, the applicant team needs to be more involved in each other's work because if the um, cost estimator is simply looking at a set of drawings and doesn't know anything about other elements in the renovation process, then those costs are not going to be included. And so we're seeing the raw numbers that just say, this is how much it costs to do this, right? That's what the cost estimator does. Gets the drawings, this is how much it costs to do this. So unless he's told, we also have to take into account the, the following things, um, he, w he won't know to do it, right? right. So, right, and, and we won't read about it. And so at the moment, it's not, a, it's not an issue. We saw what the costs are, and we saw what the inefficiencies are, and we saw that the comps maybe aren't quite on target, 
And so all of those work in your head show perhaps that 4C isn't as bad as all that, which is a lesser variance option, right? So, and again, because we're forced to look at not the programmatic needs of the theater, but at the, re at the value of the, the commercial use, um, there, there we are. Right. So and uh, also, not to mention the fact that if you look at the plans, some of the plans are actually wrong. And that actually held me up in the beginning. Oh, oh that's a good you point. Know? Yes. The page by page plans that are showing either that there's a three, three story residential or that there's a one story residential, when in fact there's a five story residential right. in all of the lesser variance scenarios actually tripped me up for a while. And I spent a couple of hours just yeah. looking back and forth trying to figure out. Who was right? Was the cost estimator and the financial person right and the plans wrong? Or was the architect partially right, partially wrong, or right. totally yes. wrong? Yes, no, that's absolutely right because there are no floor plans for the third through fifth floor residential. Right. Whereas in the sections, you see third through fifth floor residential. Right. And when you look at the cost estimates, there are five bathtubs. Right. So there must be five units. But how would anyone know that? Because you don't find the drawings, right? right? I have a humble suggestion. And I did this for my own sanity. I created a spreadsheet of all the scenarios and laid out by each floor what is being proposed, how many theaters, everything. If the applicant provide that for all the scenarios, it would be very helpful also to understand and compare back and forth. Because I was trying to read the drawings, as you said, and trying to figure out how many units are being proposed based on the plans. And then you look at the sections, and then you look at the, <coughs> the, the uh, site. Yeah, so I, 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 did, I went back and forth between the financing, the plans, the sections, and to put together just for so that I understood all the scenarios that were in front of us. That would be very helpful going forward. I'm mm -hmm. sure there might be a few more that get will get added, so mm -hmm. we can just build on it. That right. right. But again, a lot of this has to do with conforming the application to itself, and that's the job has to be the job of one person <coughs> on the team. Right. Mm -hmm. Make sure that all the parts conform and tell the same story, et cetera. Et cetera. Okay. Number 19, 2016, 43, LMBC, 136 Oxford Street, Brooklyn. They requested an adjournment. New cases, item number one. 205, 14, BC, 100-02, Rockaway Boulevard, Queens. Okay. Um, I'm not, this, <coughs> this application is a little strange because I'm not really sure why it's been at the board for so long. Um, but anyway, uh, we did have proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors, but I actually don't find proof of service of the initial application to officials. And what gives me pause about that is we also don't have a community board recommendation, oh, so sorry, I don't know if they ever sorry. received it. Um, we do have one letter of objection concerned about parking. Um, we have a Department of Investigation sign off for Tap Out and Warrior Fitness. I no longer know who the operator is on this. Um, and uh, they need to provide a first floor plan that shows the routes of egress from the second floor um, PCE, because it used to be a first floor PCE, but now it's a second floor PCE. Um, they also need to show the layout of the PCE um, in general, just showing kind of where kinds of equipment go and where the the locker rooms and all that are, that's a way of showing compliance with ADA and so on. Um, there are sprinkler and alarm notes on the plans, and this is not a legalization. Um, yeah. OK. Anything else? Anybody? No. Item number 2, 275 BC, 115 East 97th Street, Manhattan. OK. This is Marymount. Mm -hmm. um, OK, so um, with respect to notice, I um, see that we have a June 2017 proof of service to officials um, and, to, um, and to others besides the officials, and proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors in mid-August. Um, we have a complaint, though, that notice was not received by certain unspecified parties. We actually don't know the exact addresses of those parties. Um, 
the proof of notice and just to clarify the proof of notice that was provided by the applicant um, indicates that at least 70 individual forms of notice were mailed on August 18th 2017 under the BSA rules notices required to be mailed to all owners of record within a 400 foot radius and instructions on the notice and they're mailing actually a BSA form um, states that if this notice is received by the business office of a cooperative or condominium please notify all tenants of the cooperative or condominium in the office's customary manner and post the hearing notice in the common areas that actually is not required to be done by to rental buildings um, maybe the board should change its rules but um, there isn't an instruction to the manager of a rental building to post um, such notice for tenants um, so as far as we can tell, notice was proper, um, and um, we don't have more information on the specific two um, addresses that claim they didn't receive notice. Um, Community Board 11 opposes the project, but would support a shorter building that is more consistent with the East Harlem neighborhood plan, um, which disfavors mid-block high-rises. We have a letter of strong opposition from Council Member Kalos, who appears to be asking us to set aside the educational deference standard with respect to the school. Um, with respect to that, I don't d disagree that um, with respect to the apartment building, an A finding based on unique physical condition inherent to the zoning lot must be established, but deference to a school is required by the Court of Appeals. Um, we have one letter of conditional support from Civitas, primarily concerned about traffic and pedestrian impacts and the profile of school enrollment. In other words, that they should be more open to the neighborhood as um, enrollees. Um, Department of Environmental Protection is currently reviewing the phase two air quality and noise studies that were submitted mid-August. Um, we have requested a pedestrian analysis that will be sent to DOT for review. Um, so, and to get into the meat of it, it seems as if, based on the focus of the statement of facts, that the entire reason for configuring the proposed school building the way it is, is to accommodate the 7,212 square feet of open space needed to support the 2008 residential building that was constructed on lot 16 in the R72, um, which open space will be displaced by construction of the school building. That is the reason for the 35 foot deep front setback plaza, which provides 1,750 square feet of qualifying open space for the residential building. The essential waiver being sought is to allow existing open space in the C18X portion of the lot to count towards R72 open space requirements, open space ratio requirements. All of this is painted as being essential to meet the school's programmatic needs when in, in fact it's essential to meet the 2008 residential building zoning floor area requirements. If residential open space ratio were not an issue on this lot, the building could have been configured otherwise and perhaps not require as many other waivers or extend to the currently proposed height. A lesser variance version without the open space waiver needs to be explored. It could request waivers that are other kinds of waivers that are needed, but not an open space waiver. Similarly, um, the curb cut waiver seems to be driven by the location of the curb cut for the residential building and also by the configuration of the fab lab. Um, I'd like to know what the reason for the fab lab being um, on the at the building entrance is. I know this is robotics and all that. Maybe they have to like walk onto the street or <laughs> I don't know why, but anyway, so there seems to be real intentionality about putting the fab lab on street frontage, but it could be on the other frontage. I, I don't really understand. I thought that also had to do with uh, the freight elevator that is servicing the theater and, uh, and the location of the theater is also. That's also why the fab lab has to be there? No, 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 the, 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 the curb cut. The curb cut that is all providing access also needs to be close to the freight elevator um, that is serving right. the theater. But I, I, it wasn't clear. But yeah, I yeah. I mean, you could let, arguably you, you, you could put the curb cut in other places if you weren't so worried about setting back and 
you know, all that other open stuff you space. have to do for open space. If open space was no longer a conversation, how would you design this building? Um, the first floor seems also very inefficiently laid out with this long corridor running between 98th and 97th Street. I didn't understand what that's about at all. Um, with respect to programmatic needs analysis, I note the classroom schedule provided, but it isn't tied to floor plans in the building. So we can't tell which rooms are being utilized. So I have no idea really what's going on. Um, we also don't know what the specific room sizes, counts, and needs are. The programmatic needs analysis only speaks in detail about the need for a gym, auditorium, and lunchroom. I'm also not understanding where the 225 high school students are physically located at present based on the sectional diagrams provided. The schedule indicates they are all at present on the Fifth Avenue campus, but the section shows very little space allocated to them. And maybe that's because high school students in this school don't live in a particular room. Maybe, you know, they don't really have like home rooms and they just immediately go to their various classes, but that wasn't explained at all. We are used to seeing a lot of other kinds of schools where the students all stay in the same room the whole day and only go off occasionally to these other classes. Um, the layout and location of the classrooms is also very confusing with offices and mechanical spaces dominating the lower floors and windows and windowless, uh, the floors and lower floors and windows and windowless <coughs> classrooms are on the upper floors. Um, I don't understand the idea of giving up windows for classrooms. Um, and in favor of other kinds of activities. Likewise, the dining room is spread over a really long, narrow space. I don't understand that at all. And would have benefited from the 35-foot deep plaza area. So then you'd have a really nice sized room. Um, the plans read, actually, like this will be almost entirely a gym, theater, chapel, lunchroom building um, with little area allocated to classroom space and areas that might have been used for classroom space devoted early on to terraces. So there's lots of terracing that I didn't understand. Um, just when you think, oh, this would be a really good layout, there's a terrace. So I didn't understand that. A more efficient layout would have provided double loaded corridors and a lower building, it seems to me. I also don't understand the comment about compartmentation under the building code section 405.4. Um, I don't understand why both the gym and the performance space can't be in the cellar and be compartmentalized. Um, when I read the section, I don't see a prohibition about doing that. Um, there are a lot of buildings where you have fire shutters and things like that that separate the uses, and the fire shutters are operated by what's known as a fusible link, and in the event of a fire alarm, door shut, and that's that. So, um, so although the A finding for an educational institution is met through application of the Cornell Doctrine's deference standard, there is no waiver for the D finding having to do with self-created hardship. Under the May 2008 Zelda um, Zoning Lot Development Agreement, Lot 7 obtained the rights to do whatever was not being used on the zoning lot by the 2008 building and the existing building. Um, so, in other words, Lot 7, that's the subject site, got whatever was left of development rights after the 2008 building and the small existing building were taken care of. Um, presumably, the parties to the agreement who were, rep were represented by sophisticated zoning council and, um, which, um, and the agreement, which was executed after preparation and DO the approval of the open space ratio calculations, all of those parties understood what that would have meant development wise. And I want to add that when I say all of the parties, there was actually only one party. This was one developer agreeing among himself to um, do these various things on the zoning lot and um, whatever was left on lot seven, he probably figured that's the buyer's problem. Um, so it is, in fact, the buyer's problem, um, that being the school now. So, um, yeah. So um, here are my few comments uh, to it. Um, the, both in the 
As of right and in the proposed, I'm not sure why the applicant did not consider building out the cellar level to the full lot line on the south side. Um, I believe that could, uh, my question is, would, wouldn't that accommodate more space below grade like the theater and, uh, and eliminate uh, some of the vertical lift and, uh, that, uh, that is being asked for? A uh, portion of the second floor has a mechanical space and the rest of it is a, is a double height, uh, is a 10 foot height uh, floor, which could also be programmed for a lot of the other office spaces or other uh, functional uh, administrative spaces. I'm Oops, not sure. Sorry, which floor is that? Second floor. Second floor, okay. Uh, I'm not sure why that has not been looked at. That could also uh, reduce some of the uh, height and setback uh, uh, waivers. and. Uh, the programmatic need for a three-story high assembly stage, um, especially theater stage, um, I thought was weak. I would like to get a better understanding of the program that the school drives and the need for such a school. Um, I, you know, I've been to a few of the schools here. I attended one such school, and I, it being a privileged school, I hadn't seen one. Yeah, I've never seen a fly so, in a in a. High school. Yeah. So uh, uh, there's something. If it's a unique feature of the school, I, I think the programmatic need needs to be very clear and explain that uh, for the justification. Since I believe that is driving a good part of the height and setback. Okay. And I agree with you on the issue of open space. Though, uh, going back to it, I think the current use of the space as as it stands. Kind of, it's open space just on paper, but the actual uh, use is not an open space. And uh, that was another question I had: is when did that open space on lot seven stop functioning as an open space for the building? And uh, and the fact that it has remained physically open does that constitute therefore as an open space for zoning application? That right. was just a question I had, more from a do. Right, that's really a DOB call, yeah. um, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I had a question about uh, whether or not there really was a need for the chapel when you do have an auditorium. And if there is a need for a chapel, is there a possibility to locate it on a floor that already has a very high floor to ceiling height? Because to me, that chapel is also driving another floor to have a very mm -hmm. high floor to ceiling mm -hmm. height. So that's basically my questions, and I, I agree with Commissioner Shonda that they should definitely fully build it out, all of the cellar floors to the lot. Okay. Okay. That's it. Mm -hmm. Item number three, 2017 38 BZ, 1155 East 28th Street, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, we have proof of service to officials and proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Community Board 14 recommended approval on condition that the side entrance and window wells be eliminated. We have two letters of objection from neighbors stating the lot is too small for an enlargement and the project is too large for the neighborhood. The neighbor adjacent um, specifically objects to the stoop and light wells on the north side yard. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit confused about the final resolution of this. Um, there, I still see light wells in the right. drawings. And then there was another, there was a letter that was submitted that, you know, the side yard entry really doesn't work for the, our plan. And really we're hoping the neighborhood would, would reconsider and I don't really understand what's going on here. So is that the proposal or isn't that the proposal? <laughs> um, so they need to clarify that. Uh, they should provide calculations of the linear feed of existing walls to be retained in each floor and the area of existing joists at each floor to be retained. That's the threshold question. Um, the second floor looks like less than 50% of the existing exterior walls are being retained, but they need to check that. The requested floor area um, ratio appears to be in line with many other houses on the social block. Um, this waiver is to allow a reduction of the rear yard to 20 feet. Um, the rear, the greenhouse is reducing it further to 14 feet. I think the greenhouse should be eliminated. Um, 
and the house I think appears tall for the block based on the streetscape elevations but that doesn't mean they can't make a better argument looking at it with um, some other kind of we do that kind of hand rendering thing that Ryan created which makes it a lot easier to make an argument about neighborhood character I just want to point out something very strange that we've been observing in this neighborhood um, actually on this very street yes um, so this one is not proposing a garage in the rear, but when we went on a recent site visit and wandered around on this very street, we found garages uh, that had been converted to residential use. Garages within the 20-foot setback converted to residential use. We could see the chandeliers and the air conditioners on top and all that. That's illegal. And we're gonna, we can add something that avoids the permit when you use it for an illegal use. You can't have a garage that's occupied for residential use. I don't know what, I don't know what to say, but in one of our applications, under construction, one of our applications, the garage mysteriously was about three feet off the ground to its, to its first floor, its first level. So try and drive your car there. Wonder what that's for. It flies in. Yeah, it's a hovercraft. <laughs> anyway, so uh, be aware. So this one is only proposing a greenhouse, but just to let everyone know. <laughs> Hi. Can I? Yeah, yeah. I actually am, um, as far as the last plan that was submitted, it seems the, the entrance has been moved now from the side to the front. However, the light well is still there. And I, I understand the concern the adjacent neighbor is raising. Yeah, I thought the light well was just the, uh, a foot or so in front, but it goes to the entire depth of yes. the side yard all the way to the property line, which is a very unusual kind of light well to be asked for a cellar space, which is not a habitable space. Um, yeah. and, and it also <laughs> brings very close to the property line, uh, where which is being used by the adjacent neighbor as a drive driveway and this is exactly <laughs> where the car is going to come out of the garage and back in and there is a huge liability I'm sure the person is concerned about and that is why is questioning it and I do agree that we should not that be having such a deep uh, light well uh, it can be vertically deep but it doesn't have to be well actually we, all the way if you look on those houses you never see light wells you see instead a little window right. above grade and that's it it's not right. a light well it's just that the level of the first floor is high enough above grade to give you a little right. bit of a something to look down below yeah. right and they the, are not this building has a lot of nice other enclosed facility features greenhouse yes. and other rear yards I'm not sure why there's a need for this full uh, length of a light well all the way right. to the property line um, we I did see though on a lot of houses in this on this block specifically that have doors on the side that are clearly going down into the cellar um, that are Which obviously the Airbnbs, Airbnbs or whatever. <laughs> well, they're not supposed to be habitable, right? No, they're not. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Item number 4, 2017, 49BZ, 243 West 124th Street, Manhattan. Okay, this one we have proof of service of initial hearing to officials and proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. Community Board 4 recommended approval. We have one letter in support. Um, the DOI, though, reported that one of the principals of this operation, um, actually the main principal, was arrested in 2013 and then subsequently, um, I believe, he paid a fine right you paid a thousand dollar fine and was given one year conditional discharge okay so but so the offense was which unfortunate was um, bribery yeah which was unrelated to the kinds of things for which a PCE is regulated so it's not that um, it's true so the PCE exists to prevent Houses of ill repute. That's but is why. It part of the illegality of having a house of ill repute is paying public officials to look the other way. 
This was on construction. Construction. Yeah. This was respect to construction. So, all right. So, I'm going to just and leave the, that to everybody. Prior, this happened in 2013. I will say, though, that the prior application, the, the, the cliffs was a prior application. Um, under, under uh, There was another calendar number, and this issue came up that you, uh, when his arrest could happen. Oh, for a different And cliffs. this is the resolution that I had showed you. Uh -huh. And so, it did mention it, and the board. Still approved. Still approved the PC. Yes. So at the time, he had just been arrested. Right? Arrested for, right, for, for the for the offense. For the but offense. at this point, he's been, been prosecuted. Convicted. Convicted. And he had to pay a fine. And he's paid a fine. One and year. So I'm sure it's probably one year stat of problems. So he's and he is dead, right? Right? That's what Literally. we would argue. Paid his debts to yes. society. Yes. Still allowed yes. to vote in the elections. Yes. Etc. Yes. 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 They don't sign no, off. No, they no. give a report. They it's give then a report. up to us. They never sign off. They, right. Yeah, they don't sign off. They just report. Um, and then I also look at kind of this is an important um, uh, project in this neighborhood. Yeah. So, you know, like a, actually an incredibly cool climbing gym. Mm -hmm. So, it's not on 124th Street. It's yeah. so impressive. Yeah, it was a theater. Yes, it was. So, a and it makes an amazing. Talk about the use of a fly. <laughs> if that's what you should do with a fly, you should climb the wall of it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> anyway, and so um, we don't have a specific sign off from fire department. It's not a legalization, so they have the notes. Um, that's it. We haven't heard from fire department on any of these. Yeah, they're having a little technical. Yeah, it seems like it. Yeah. Okay. We just need the applicant also. Um, I think right, Tracy. We uh, you put a note notations about this is a um, hazmat. Hazmat. A D, e designation. I'm sorry. No, it has an e designation. E designation, okay. right? But he has a notation on one of the sheets of the plans, which is the note sheet. Yeah. He needs to add. We had told him he needed to add those to the regular plans, but unless you had some other things like to, you know. No. Add everything. On. I, I noted the e, e notation, so yeah, he's, it seems like it's all in order. Okay. Okay. Just a very minor, minor correction on the plan and the statement of facts. They just need to make sure that the floor area that has been cited for the first floor is consistent. In one location, it's cited as 425 square feet, and the other one is 484. So they just need to oh. make sure the floor area numbers are correct. Okay. Correct both of those documents. So that has to be done immediately otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, right. This is Tony, this is yours. It's me. Yeah, okay. Ready to move on? Yep. Mm -hmm. Item number 5, 2017 53 BZ, 24 West 25th Street, Manhattan. Um, yes. This is a legalization. We do have proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors, but I didn't find proof of service of the initial application to officials, even though we have a community board um, statement that they're waiving their right to have a hearing on this. And we have one letter in support. The applicant provided photos showing the sprinklers and alarms installed, and also provided BIS printouts of applications for their installation, but no proof of completion or sign off by fire department. So here's a situation where we really need the fire department. Okay. Move on. Mm -hmm. Item number six, 2017, 188 BC, 1727, Ocean Park in Brooklyn. Okay. So we have proof of notice of hearing to officials and neighbors. We don't have anybody listening. Um, but I don't find proof of service of the initial application. We do, however, have a community board recommendation, so that always implies that it was served, but we just I don't find it in the folder. Okay, um, community board recommended approval. Um, with respect to the front wall, the existing shows its, and this is going to the threshold question, the existing shows its 29 foot 8 inches and 30, and also because there's a step in it, 30 feet back from the property line, whereas the proposed drawing drawing shows it straightened as 30 feet back from the property line and to be retained. So um, if it's going to be retained, how's it going to be retained if you're moving it back? 
um, and maybe that's just a mistake, right? Um, the first floor is being dropped um, and the cellar is being excavated. Um, so the applicant has to, again, with respect to the threshold, discuss how the joists and the existing exterior walls will be retained if you do that. Um, you know, most of this existing building is being retained. It's just being extended at the rear and on top by a lot. Do you need the architect here tomorrow? Yeah, always. <coughs> Um, a porch is not a permitted obstruction within the required 30-foot front yard in the Ocean um, Parkway yeah. Special District. So there's these dash lines shown on the proposed drawings that don't have dimensions. Um, there is an existing 11-foot deep porch. Um, is it the intention to retain that? Like what's the dash lines about? Um, there needs to be a note on the drawings. Um, that says DOB to determine whether the porch within the front yard is permitted so that we won't get involved in whether that's a permitted obstruction. Um, there's, I, I was trying to understand, and again, I always admit that I'm not a driver, but there are cars parked in the back, and I don't see how they make the turn, especially with the porch that's in the rear. It's like this sharp right angle turn, and I don't really see how they get there. Um, and then um, to note, this is a really massive house. Um, so I'd like to know how you justify the two-story rear yard extension, and why can't the uh, and the, which has this elevator and stair core at the back back, and um, which remains. So the the third floor sets back, but the fact that the elevator and stair core are there forces the third floor to stay in, within that 20 foot. Um, setback, right? <coughs> so I'd like to know why the elevator st and stair can't be moved closer to the front of the building to remove it from the rear yard obstruction and to make it generally more convenient because by the way, if you're really in need of an elevator, why are you having to go through the entire house to get there? And it's also like not conveniently located to the kitchen. There's a lot of things where if you have an elevator, you wouldn't put the elevator there. Um, the proposed lot coverage at 52% is high for the tax and social blocks, as is the floor area ratio. So I think if you, um, and, and this, there, this is a really huge house. So even though it's a two, it's a two family house, but the one of them is enormous. And it seems to me that there's a lot of room for cutting back the second floor um, away from that 20 foot rear yard. I think the house is also very tall for the block, for the block, so to um, support this argument, they need to do one of those streetscape renderings that we talk about. Those are the 3D renderings, not the two-dimensional renderings. Streetscape street 3D? Yeah. Um, anybody else on this? So basically the massive is an issue. Yeah, very much. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of an interesting approach because this is a semi-attached house or right. semi-detached depending on They're how you look at it. The two family, two stories, but up on top, right. right. So as opposed to the other ones that's so unfortunate where they're just enlarging one side of the attached, this one at least they're enlarging the whole thing, but they're really enlarging the whole thing. It's kind of an interesting typology though of this sort of split level where some of it's some of it on one side is for one house and some of it on the next floor is for the other house and you know this is an apartment. yeah kind of and it, but there's like one is seven bedrooms with a lot of huge family spaces and it seems like room to play so um, okay uh-huh yep. yep this concludes the public review session for September 11 2017.